Good evening and welcome to our continued Saturday Night Alive Bible study. Uh, we finished up last week, 1 Corinthians, and obviously it was very fitting then to go right into um, um, 2 Corinthians. I think it's important for us to realize Paul had a very special relationship with the Corinthian church. He obviously started the church, spent several years in Corinth. We know he wrote at least one other letter and um, that we are aware of. And to say that he was very invested in this church is probably uh, a great understatement. This letter in, in, in many ways is a response letter, not answering questions as much as circumstances and things that Paul had heard about. Um, but we're going to start tonight with verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance for the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. This is one of those verses you kind of have to read a couple of times. I'm, I'm not going to reread it, but I am going to do a little explaining because I'll be honest with you, I, I saw something new in here, something that honestly I had not seen before. Can't count the number of times that I have read this scripture, but, um, but I see this so clearly. Verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Get this the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort. And this Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, comforts us, all of us, in our times of troubles. Why? So that we then can comfort those in any trouble with that same comfort that we ourselves have received from God. We are comforted not to keep it as a secret, not to put it in a bottle, not to put it under our pillow, but the comfort we receive in our times of trouble is given to us so that we then can share that comfort we receive from the Holy Spirit with other people. So Paul praises God. He praises the God of compassion and comfort who comforts us in our times of trouble so that we can comfort those in trouble, <coughs> excuse me, with the same comfort. So our trouble comes that the comfort we receive can comfort others in times of hurt. Anyone who's ever heard me preach for any length of time, of course, has heard me say, uh, repeat and preach on James 1, 3, for the testing of our faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work that we might be more mature, more complete, not lacking anything. You know that this verse is telling us that trials do come our way. And they come our way so that we might learn to persevere in our trials. But that perseverance will finish its work that we might be more mature, more complete, not lacking anything. So it's been a comfort to me when I hurt, when I struggle, when I go through trials, when I go through tribulations, God is using these to make me more like him. But that's just now I realize the first part of trials is to make me more like him. But there is a second part of trials. The second part of the trials is the comfort I receive in the midst of the trials. And that is the comfort that I need to learn to share with other people. Think of it this way. The devil comes, kill, steal, and destroy. He brings trials into our life to destroy us. God not only brings us through those trials, but makes us more like him in the midst of those trials. And now we see that the comfort we receive in the midst of those trials is given to us to carry us through the trials 
but it doesn't end there. We are to give that comfort to others in the midst of their trials. Now, I think sometimes when we see those who are struggling, who those who are in trials, those who have tribulations, I think our famous words as Christians is, is simply this, well, I'll pray for you, brother. I'm going to pray for you, sister. I understand, and, and, and I'm going to pray for you. Well, Paul is saying, you know, that's a start, and, and he's not, and, and I'm no way am I discounting this. But if we are distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of that same suffering, the sufferings that we ourselves have suffered. <clears throat> Another important point, the sharing of our pain and comfort is because Paul understood something. I, I have to share my comfort with you because we are really one body. When I hurt my knee, my entire body responds and the whole body compensates to remove the stress, the pressure, the weight, and the pain on the knee. So, yes, when a brother or sister struggles, pray for them, but please go beyond that. Share that pain. Give comfort. Act like one body. Help compensate in their hearts and lives by taking some of that pain, taking some of that hurt, taking some of that load from them. Amen. I, I love that. Verse 8. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. There is that place of prayer. Then many will give thanks on, on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to this prayers of many. You know, I love reading Paul when I'm going through struggles and trials, tribulations, health issues, personal problems, hurts, pains, pressures, you know, all of those things that life tend to send our way. And, and actually, when I say life, I really actually mean the devil, the one who has come to kill, steal, and destroy. So let me see. So for me, I recently got over, <coughs> excuse me, a serious infection, having gallbladder problems. Some local acquaintances are truly making life difficult for me. And at 65, I find myself beginning to look for a new job. I could really say a big ug and, and even get upset. But again, I, uh, I have Paul as, as an example for me. And, and on my worst day, I look at Paul and on my worst day, still, <coughs> it, my worst day is still better than Paul's best day. Paul is kind of the king of struggles, the king of trials, the king of tribulation. He knows what difficulties life can bring. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself because in, in chapter um, 11 in 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, and you all know it. I have preached it many times. I've worked harder, been in prison more often, been whipped times uh, without number, faced death again and again five times. The Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers, from robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I've faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty, I've gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Well, wow. um, Paul certainly understood trials and tribulations. Just want to say this, you know, um, 
when something to me is not clearly stated in the Bible, I will say so. You know, Paul used to say, I, Paul, say. And, and this is one of those situations. This is something that I say. Um, because, and what I'm saying is, we know in 2 Corinthians, Paul is responding to the church. And the church and its people were struggling. We know that. We know that that not only the Corinthian church, but all churches were struggling at that time, but certainly the Corinthian church was. Um, kind of like a lot of people, almost all people, in the church of today is. Um, you hear a lot of woe is me and people complaining about the hardships and difficulties, trials, tribulations, struggles, sicknesses, and all of those things that people are going through. Paul doesn't complain, but he does say this. I don't want you to be uninformed. That's the first thing he says. I want you to know. How can we pray for one another if we don't know? Paul wanted those prayers. I think sometimes we as a church hold things in too tightly because we don't want people to know our struggles and in our trials and tribulations, our things. So we, we hold it within. Sometimes they say, well, just pray for me. Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed. I want you to pray intelligently. We, when we were out there doing your work, we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. We had, in fact, um, believe we had received the sentence of death. We thought we were going to die. Third thing he says, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but God. He says, you know, it causes me to realize I can't handle this. God, you have to help me through. And then Paul says, and he will deliver us again. And then he says, on him we have set our hope that we will continue, that he will continue to deliver us. As he has done in the past, he will do again. And then he says, church, you have been and you will actively be involved. How? By praying actively. It doesn't just say praying, but actively involved by praying. And then the sixth thing he says, many will give thanks as the prayers are answered. And the prayers we know are answered for Paul time and time again. So when Paul, when I go through difficulties in these trials and tribulations, I do think of Paul and I think of all that he has, that he went through. And life seems to be a little bit easier for me then. Verse 21, it goes on to say, now it is God who makes both of us and you Stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set a seal of ownership on us. And he put a spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. I love this, this verse. It's always been one of my favorites. I know I always say that, and I have so many favorites, but, but this is truly one of them. You see, we know that God wants us to stand firm in our relationship with Christ. In other words, he knows we can't stand firm on ourselves, but we can stand firm. He wants us to stand firm in our relationship with Christ. And it says in 21, it is God that helps us to do this. Church, please understand tonight, you are not on your own. Day in, day out, whatever you're going through, whatever your trials are, whatever your tribulations are, whatever your struggles are, Whatever you're going through, you are not on your own. And I will say this as a one who's had quite a bit of experience. Um, if I had to stand firm on my own, I would spend most of my time on my face. In fact, I would dare say if I had to stand firm on my own power, I would probably just stay on my face because it would save me a lot of time for falling and getting up, falling and getting up. I know this, that he is there with me. He is the one that helps me. Jesus helps me to stand firm in him. We are so blessed having a God who not only loves us, but, but helps us to stand firm in Christ. How does he do that? He tells us. First, it says that he anointed us. It's that Holy Spirit. That's who helps us to stand firm in Christ. It's the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own. It is, it's that he anointed us. He's put the Holy Spirit within us. It says he set a seal or proof of ownership, which is again, that Holy Spirit. That's his proof to us 
of his ownership. Because we have the Holy Spirit within us, that's the proof that we are his. And that's the proof that he is going to help us to stand firm. That Holy Spirit is in our hearts, and that Holy Spirit also serves as a deposit and guaranteeing. A deposit of what? And guaranteeing what? A greater time of true fellowship, both here on earth, becoming more like Jesus today than yesterday, more like Jesus tomorrow than today. That same, So that Holy Spirit within us is a guarantee of true fellowship and greater fellowship with the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And by the way, the actual time of fellowship is very close at hand. I think we all sense and know that as we look around in this world that is actually decaying right in, in before our very eyes. So we're closing out tonight, Second um, Corinthians 2. But thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere for we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. Another verse that can be, you got to read this one several times through, but it also helps to understand the history. By the way, Paul is, just in case you didn't get it, he's kind of changing direction here. Um, but he makes a very interesting point. So in Roman times... Um, after a great victory, a general would bring in the captives. But along with the captives would bring in a great amount of incense. I would probably dare say maybe the incense is because those captives probably stunk to high heavens. But um, again, it doesn't say anything about that, but the, they would bring in the incense. And so here it is, the incense. People would see the captives, but they'd smell the incense. And if you were sympathetic... Um, if you were if if you were sympathetic to the captives, then that incense would to you would be sickening, wouldn't it? If those were your friends, your fellow um, uh, people from different tribes and different nations were being brought in, you saw them in chains and beaten and dirty and and, and dying. Um, then that 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 smell, you wouldn't smell the incense; you'd smell the smell of death, and it would be distressing to you. To the Romans, of course, that incense was pleasing. It was proof of another victory. Um, so to the Romans, the incense was life. To those sympathetic, it was death. So we are joining in on Christ's spiritual uh, procession. We ourselves are a pleasing aroma of Christ. Um, the thing is, to those who are saved, it is a pleasing aroma of salvation. But to those who are perishing, it's reminding them of their death and to those who are perishing it is a sickening smell because it's reminding of them that they're not in Christ and therefore it is displeasing so tonight we have so much to praise God for um, but one of them is we stand firm we stand firm because the Holy Spirit keeps us firm um, and in the midst of our trials, we are comforted, not only to help us through our difficulties, but then in that comfort, that word, that testimony, that deed, we can then comfort other people. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this evening. Lord, I just pray your anointing and your blessing upon your word. I thank you for the comfort given to us in our times of trials and tribulations. That comfort comes our way that we might be a comfort to other people. Lord, we thank you that you do hold us firm in the midst of our struggles and trials and tribulations, and that firmness is in, not in our own strength, but it is in the Holy Spirit. And lastly, we thank you that we are a sweet aroma, that that Holy Spirit, we, we are a sweetness before the church, and we are sweetness before the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, so much is going on now in in our government and Lord I'm starting to realize that Lord that in the midst of these trials and tribulations Lord we really truly absolutely need you we give you praise for all things in Jesus name amen